from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, um, thanks for, for having me here. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really honored. Uh, I just arrived in the US in April to start working for Rhizome and I'm already here in the Library of Congress. That's, <laughs> that's really the land of opportunities here. So, <laughs> um, so my, my background is um, actually um, electronic musician and internet artist. Uh, I'm not a trained librarian or archivist or anything. Um, however, my artistic work, which I uh, do mostly with uh, the net art pioneer Olya Jalina, is uh, very much concerned about how to write a history for the digital age. So it is, yeah, because I think, um, yeah, it has some certain properties that, that really ask for actually how to, how to historicize it not what what exactly to do next or something. Um, yeah, so I moved here in April to work for Rhizome and um, the art base. So Rhizome is a, is a, a non-profit that is uh, concerned with uh, uh, supporting digital art and digital culture. And um, the art base, uh, it was founded in 1996, mostly by, uh, by the internet art community and um, in 1998, the art base was uh, released, and it is a, uh, I brought it down here, it's a, a collection of born digital artifacts in a user-generated archive, and uh, so I see there's some traits of archival futurism in it. So there, there's really, there was a, er everybody could become an artist by uploading their artworks to the art base. There was a very low entry barrier, which was, um, it has to be new media art, and then it could be taken. But this is, um, this is really digital culture, so uh, very, very fluid, and the roles can change any time, and you don't need a, yeah, you don't need a history or anything to, to suddenly participate there. And um, in the meantime, this uh, art base has become as it's stated in a report from 2011 by, by Ben Fino Redin, who worked for Rhizome uh, at that point, was it became an archive of historic media art, which is true. And uh, it can be said about many of these very uh, utopian archives uh, that existed uh, of, of for digital culture. But I wonder how, how this happened. It, it is now a heavily curated um, place, the art base. Um, so we see here the artworks, we see categories and everything. Uh, and I wonder how this happened, how these how this archives grew stale and uh, yeah, became something like this, which is, which is great. I don't say this is bad or anything, I'm just wondering. So, And um, I believe that this is because how uh, such art archives are commonly thought about on the level of operations and it happens when the artifacts that uh, should be stored don't follow the object logic to a degree so that they don't stop making sense inside this archive or the archive doesn't make sense for them anymore. So um, let me go down on this perspective a bit. Uh, so in, in general, I'm from the perspective of digital culture really and I think uh, sometimes um, when we are talking about edge cases on the conferences here, we say, oh yeah, this is like, this will work great and this will work great and this will work great. There's just this edge case, this is art. Um, but uh, I think if we look uh, at the practice of how users are uh, behaving on the web, I think the border in between art and whatever is absolutely uh, blurry. So that's why it might be interesting to what I say. That's what I <laughs> why I made this statement. So um, I want to start with this stupid uh, image, um, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a which is a representation of 16 bits, and um, I I use this notation O and L, which I have seen in a 
in a uh, introductory manual to computer science from Siemens uh, from the 70s. And I, I always thought, wow, what's up with these guys? They don't even know zeros and ones. But the thing is, there are no, there are no zeros and ones, in fact. I mean, the, the bits are, the zero and one is like, we're already saying that this is a number, but in fact, these are just two different symbols. And the only reason that they are two, it's because this is the simplest thing that one can distinguish, which is two different things. So, um, so we don't know what this is. This could be a, I don't know, I have here a nice list. It could be an integer, a float. It could be noted in Little Indian, back in uh, Big Indian. It could be a letter in some whatever encoding. It could be a pixel in some RGB, RGBA, whatever. It could be an audio sample that is signed or not. Or it could be a processor instruction that actually creates something um, uh, that, uh, yeah. In, in instructs the CPU to do something. And this can be assigned more or less arbitrarily. So each, each data point uh, needs additional data about itself somewhere else describing what it's, what's it supposed to happen. Um, and depending on how the machine then operates on these bits, uh, they move towards different meanings. And this is why I think it is productive to say that everything inside a computer is a performance. And it's based on some narration and expectation already on this super primitive level. And um, yeah, so uh, I think this is a, it can be productive to think about this, especially when it comes to digital culture. So there is this um, performance, what computers do, and there is activities, what users do. And so, and I um, want to illustrate this on a very nice uh, and kind of authoritative uh, example of how da data can be accessed. I'm using here Google's, uh, whoops, no, this is the wrong one. I want to go to Google's Zeitgeist globe here. So um, this is a very nice thing. This is, uh, Stuttgart is the place, is the town in Germany where I'm from. And this apparently shows what uh, users were searching for, or what was on user's mind, rather, uh, on the New Year's Day of 2013. And this is a very attractive simulation, uh, not visualization. So I can turn this globe here, and then some something in the back will also turn, which is very exciting. And um, I c let's see what is what was up in my town. So Sylvester Million, Idealo Typico, Zombieland, Calendar. So let's compare that with Berlin. Where's Berlin? Somewhere here. Ah, come on. Ah. Yeah, it's difficult to. Uh. Ah, here it is. So there's Lieferheld. Lieferheld is a. This is something like seamless, but in Germany. Um, so, what is what 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 does this tell us? So this is of course Stuttgart. This is like a very conservative town. There's engineers live there. They broom the streets every day and they construct Mercedes's. And in Berlin, there are living all these young, crazy people that just partied all night and then they need to order some takeout food. <laughs> because, because uh, yeah, uh, not like the people in Stuttgart, they, they don't, look, they, they bought a calendar or they thought about calendar, they planned ahead and their fridge is full. <laughs> um, but, uh, what I just told you is completely made up. I just pulled this out of my nose. <laughs> and this is <laughs> um, uh, it, but it makes a very nice story. And, and I mean, I show, I show next to it a visualization of a globe. So it probably means that this data was recorded by satellites and by the, by the NASA probably. <laughs> so it must be, must be totally authentic and, and real. And, um, but what we should really be asking is, why are these words grouped into cities and not to other words? And why am I spinning this globe when in fact users were typing this in on a search field? And where are all the sex-related searches? <laughs> so, um, and uh, what, we, what we have here, the, this globe is um, making use of a, another cool thing that computers can do. 
and this is on, on a higher level than the bits, and this is uh, creating relations, also arbitrarily. So as long as uh, any data set has a primary key that makes sure that every record is unique and a foreign key that makes sure that it can be linked with some other data set, then um, I can tell any kind of story with it depending on how many hops I accept from one data set to another. Um, so why Google uses this globe? Let's spin it a bit so to give the engineer some credit. Um, <laughs> Google already has a lot of spatial data in order to show the points of interest on their map service and they also have a calendar. And I mean not the Google calendar, but they have, they know, they have information about time, how time passes. Um, and then they have all these searches for which they record a place and time when they occur probably. And, and what to do with all of this? Of course, uh, nothing else can come from it than this globe. But, um, <laughs> With, with, with dots on it and a time slider. And, and not, n nothing what we see here is a lie or anything, but it, it's kind of meaningless or at least missing the point. And um, so what was really happening on New Year's Day is just probably this. So I type here, so what shall I do with my life? <laughs> uh, uh, I can also ask why is Sonic the Hedgehog so fast or um, <laughs> this what I have here is an interface uh, to this archive of searches that is that narrates that is powerful that also is very close to the activity and performances of what happened on New Year's Day so I am typing and all these supercomputers are calculating something and something very similar happened on New Year's Day. So this uh, kind of narrates very very well. And um, I think m maybe you are familiar with this uh, culture that ha happens around this autocompleter. Uh, there's a lot of users just making screenshots of the funniest thing they can find there. And nobody makes screenshots of this globe, um, <laughs> which so, and, uh, but we, we could also, although here the, the data is uh, kind of representing itself, it doesn't need any aid, it doesn't need any new form. I mean, it's, of course, it's technically super sophisticated, right? But um, it is just these things, and they are freed up from a constraint of space and time because they are not linked to something else. And the searches on the globe are really blocked up somewhere. I can't do anything with them, and I won't make a screenshot them because it's so lame, kind of, <laughs> yeah? So yeah, when it, when it comes to this idea of activity, um, this globe subordinates the user's activity and focuses on activity of the database designer and ultimately the query. And the autocompleter gives access to recorded activities through similar activities. Um, so another example or how this, how this also could go. I think this autocompleter is fantastic, so I don't want to bash Google or anything, it's, but it's just, these things come so naturally to put things on a globe. Um, so, and uh, since um, 2011, I am together with Olya Jalina again analyzing this GeoCities torrent that I won't give an introduction to, let's just say for those who don't know, it's Jason Scott was involved. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have this, uh, 36 million files and roughly one terabyte of data. And this is, this is not big data. Anybody who uses Hadoop will uh, laugh about us, but for two people, it's quite much. And um, so we thought about how, how can we get access to this? And um, so when I show this graphic here, this is usually, it's usually very popular and some people on the internet already called this more beautiful than GeoCities was which, um, but, but, but it's not the point, because it's, it's actually the same thing as the globe. It introduces some um, order where there was no order. Um, and I could run it on my root file system, it would produce the same beautiful picture. But so I used it as a tool uh, to, to, uh, find, um, to find problems, restoration uh, problems. So what, where are, where are files double, where are ultimately uh, hundreds of nested directories. 
So um, there is actually no reasonable metadata on these files, of course. Uh, they're, they're not even valid HTML or anything. This is all handmade, hand typed in Microsoft Notepad home pages mostly. Um, so, huh. in 2013, I managed to finish this screenshot factory after two years of really painful restoration of the actual data. And this thing does the following. It's a, an emulator that runs a legacy operating system and a browser, it's a legacy browser that serves by itself through this restored version of GeoCDs and starting in 1994 and moving towards 2009 and makes a screenshot of all the home pages while going there and um, uh, posts it to Tumblr. And Tumblr has a posting limit that we figured out every 20 minutes a new screenshot. And this is material for like 14 years of tumbling. <laughs> and <coughs> I want to show it. It's, a, it's actually a quite popular Tumblr. It approaches 14,000 subscribers. And this is how it looks. We are here in the, we are here already in the late 90s. It's Internet Explorer has taken over. But yeah, this is how it looks. It posts and posts and posts. And um, these, uh, these uh, pictures, they are heavily staged, I, I call it. So let's, I have some examples here. Oh yeah, let's look at the archive first, which also shows, I think, that the speed of access to material can sometimes, or at least in, in many cases, can uh, counter a lack of metadata that would give another form of navigation. So I can really flip through that, and if I have a trained eye, and in the meantime I have one, I can also take the local copies of these images and flip through them and see, oh, there is an animation of Felix the cat running on a star background. I want to investigate that. <laughs> and <coughs> uh, because these are, these are cultural uh, forms of folkloristic expression that, that are very, uh, yeah, they, they have a meaning. Uh, we are, um, Olya and me, we are really into, into digital folklore and um, the vernacular web. <laughs> so um, let me show you how the screenshots are designed. So this is a page on Internet Explorer, right? Oh, yeah, Internet Explorer. Don't want to show to you. I want to show Netscape here, this one. Yeah. So um, the browser is still there. The operating system is still there. And I installed, I mean, this is not Windows 98, but it's Windows 2000, which I configured to look like Windows 98. And it is also that this web page, it might be uh, from 1996, this browser didn't even exist in 1996. But I mean, it's fine. I did a great job. And uh, I installed this plugin that replaced background MIDI music that now is represented on the screenshot. So this is not. I don't know, I, I d I'm not hung up about authenticity or anything, because anyway, this is, I could, I could watch this with Internet Explorer 11 and it would be authentic because I did it. And I just sent a robot there to, to do that for me. And so these screenshots are made to look attractive and to, to be rebloggable. They are 800 to 600. The Netscape browser is really beautiful. Um, and it shows the, um, the the audience, I can't call them, the users on Tumblr. It shows them a pre-industrial internet that most of them have never seen because they're very young. <laughs> and no, but for them it's really interesting. And I, and, but they are, they are interested in visual culture. Uh, this is why I chose Tumblr as a publishing platform. And they are re, re no how it's called, they are noting it like nothing. Sometimes it's even an empty Netscape window that gets lots of nodes because Netscape is a, yeah, it's just another generation of software that doesn't try to be transparent and current software tries to be totally, that you don't even notice it's there, it's a design goal and Netscape says, hey, I'm the internet, I'm, they invented this complete interface, I mean, it's a fantastic software. <coughs> um, yeah. So, what is the difference here between me just staging this like a theater play and Google just putting this on a globe? 
Um, I, I think there are, there are important differences. So I didn't create a new context that prevents further user activity, but one that enables more user activity. These screenshots are usable. These uh, young people on Tumblr, they take it and recombine them with others and what, what they do on Tumblr, right? And, or they put it on Facebook and get more followers or I don't know how it's called on Facebook, what these young people do, right? <laughs> 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 Likes or something, right? And um, do you see these pages? They were highly communicative. They were, uh, and now they can be used for communication again. So this is also, I see, I see the parallel to, to tell the story. Um, and they are not the end product. They are more of an entrance portal into the actual story. And, and what, we all, uh, what is also important about this is not about taking apart the actual uh, data. It's about to, to restage this computational, this standardized computational performance of taking this, all these different files and putting them together into one representation and then making one kind of uh, undividable object out of it, uh, this screenshot that can survive in the current social media tempest that is, yeah, it can't, can't be ripped apart anymore, but through this it can narrate. And if I look at, at just the star background image or something, it doesn't narrate at all. Or if I try to look for, for keywords or things like that. <coughs> okay. Yeah, so um, this has all been strangely in the, uh, in the world of art and not in the world of conservation. So this has been in exhibitions and things like this. But of course, my part of my job at Rhizome is how to figure out uh, what interesting things can be maybe put into an institutional process that, that come from rather this uh, way of, yeah, of conservation or, or trying to even tap into resources that are akin to uh, oral history maybe. So um, I will jump over this. I think um, there, there are several problems with, uh, I can start this already because this takes so long. Um, so there are this, there's a, the, the perspective on digital art is really that the, um, that this instability and variability is not a, is not a problem. It's more or less just a, it's just a thing that we have to deal with. It's not that we are, that we need to remove this. And, um, but on the other hand, things need to be in some kind of form. They need to exist on some banal level that can be, that just can, yeah, they just need to exist somewhere. They need to be referenceable and things like that. But it can also be done activity-based. So um, uh, this is the catchily named emulation as a service uh, uh, project called BWFLA from the University of Freiburg in Germany. And um, we are working, Rhizome is a research partner with them. And what we found out is that the, the sheer amount of, I mean, every, every, digital every collection of digital culture is by definition too large for the institution that, it, that tries to handle it because it's digital culture. And to remove uh, or to, to make too uh, crazy of a selection or, or too strict of a selection system would be a problem when it's about representing digital culture. So, but we can't put all this effort into every single artifact because the artifacts are also so heterogeneous and they are changing all the time. So it is probably productive to move a bit to uh, trying to conserve the banal and the, and the standard and the, because the, the environments in which these artworks perform or artifacts, because uh, as I said, the borders are blurry. They are quite standardized. So, um, so there can be a there can be a way of um, standard uh, of thinking about how these systems are built. And ah, oh, nice, yeah. So, you see, it's a big difference to just a screenshot. But the um. <laughs> I don't know what's funny about this. This is digital culture. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody laughed about the globe. So <laughs> you can, and the globe is actually something that is funny. And 
Um, so how, how, did I come, how did I create this system here that is able to, to show the original URL? I mean, I, I'm, it's just like it was back then. Um, I start out with a, I mean, th th the main thing is that conceptually we need to separate the artifact from the system that is enabling its performance. And then we can start with a standardized system in this case. It's Mac OS 9, and I would have to make certain alterations to it. I would maybe need to uh, change the screen resolution like that, or turn up the sound, or, or install a QuickTime plugin, or whatever. But each of these steps that I do is recorded automatically while I, while I do it as a, as a difference to the base image. And so like this, I can have dependency trees on that, for example, I mean, if any of you still remembers this pain, that you need all this drop stuff and stuff it expanders and whatever to, to in, in fact, get anything to work on Mac. So um, one of these things is that first I take the operating system, I make sure that the stuff it expander is on it, then I will unpack the browser and so on. And then I have this, uh, I have this environment that is able to do lots of other things to all kinds of artifacts that fit the same class. And so I don't need to know that much anymore about the artifact itself, just like <laughs> when might it be running. Um, yeah, isn't that nice? And then there is, so, so we are thinking ab at, at Rhizome really about this, this uh, fluidity of access and different forms of access. So I, it could be a screenshot, it could be the website in the normal browser, it could also be in the emulator and this the works, they, they travel through all of these because, yeah, I mean, it starts on the artist server maybe, and if you're lucky, we get a copy, and then it will move to be looked at in a contemporary client, in a contemporary browser from our archive at some point when the artist server switched off, and then at one point, it will have to flow into emulation. But, yeah, all of these forms are totally valid. Um, and then another thing where this activity uh, and, and performance uh, thing might help. So also when I see, for example, this, that I configure an emulator to also see this as a record of an activity, it's, it's quite nice. And um, then there is, a, but then there is a, the problem with an object boundary. Uh, let's look at here at globalmove.us by Jody, which is a, which is one of these headache artworks that, I mean not, I mean not because you get a headache from it, but, um, oh sorry, I have to do this here. So, um, be but because it is uh, so unstable, it, it's already in, a, in the form there is now, you see there are some, uh, the Google Maps service changed already so much that it doesn't show all the uh, tiles that it should be showing. And, um, and the thing is that it's, it uses algorithmical graphics, it uses randomness to choose these icons, and it uses Google Maps. So how do I tackle that? And the thing is just, I will just record what happens. And um, this works like this. So uh, this is a website, and it's running in a browser, and it does all kinds of crazy things. And uh, down here, it connects to a proxy, to um, a proxy that was written by Ilya Kramer, by the way, and who was very cooperative with Rhizome to add some features to his tool set that we need. And it will, hey, oh yeah, of course, uh, something doesn't work. But what this, th I connected this browser through this proxy with Google Maps and everything, and this browser, and this proxy will just record all the HTTP traffic in between the um, browser and the whatever whatever other service. And it also does fake certificates, so it does HTTPS. It's like a man-in-the-middle attack, actually. And then if I didn't make some stupid mistake, it would record a walk file in here that I wanted to show off right now, which doesn't work. But, yeah, well, we are just starting out. And through this, we, we, have, um, we have made an object boundary just by looking at the activities. Uh, 
that, that happen. And I can also, I mean, if I want to really conserve all of this, I just go through all of these elements by myself, which is, I think, can also be automated probably. If I manage to automate Netscape 4, I think then somebody might be able to automate Chrome or Firefox. Okay, um, that's what I wanted to show. Thanks for having me again. Just a silly question, but when you get the emulator running, will people be able to do any kind of searching on GeoCities? Um, as a teen, I built some GeoCities sites, and I have no idea. I know, I wasn't going to ask this, but nobody else had a question. I, I, I get this question so often. <laughs> so um, would I be able to search for it? Because I don't remember the URL. <laughs> um, there is, I, I didn't create a search for it yet. But, and I, I also don't think that I want to host it in general. And, and, and public because there are already other copies around that have been modified in certain ways that I don't approve of, but it's in general there. And um, yeah, uh, but in general, you could be able to use this this browser to listen to the MIDI Backstreet Boys MIDI <laughs> file that you embedded into your page. <laughs> Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time talking about accurate preservation. You've been talking about instability, changes, variability as potentially assets or at least not problems. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little about if something you create, you wanted someone to be able to experience it later, is it uh, 10 years from now? is Accuracy important to you? Uh, what do you think about preservation? Oh, as an as an exhibiting artist, I drive curators up the wall if they if they use the wrong projector. Um, <laughs> but this is a totally another situation because if I put something online, uh, if it's really about internet art, then what do I have? What what say do I have? And what users are doing with that? It is. Uh, it is, if you remember this um, small uh, animations like, watch this with Internet Explorer 5. And I say, yeah, okay, I can't. Sh what shall I do? Shall I leave now? Shall I, shall I buy a Windows machine with Internet Explorer 5? Of course I won't, I will just continue. And um, this is kind of a, it's kind of liberating when you have this art base that is just essentially Internet art, but it's also, yeah, it's also sometimes it's critical to, to find out, um, shall we make this decision, uh, what, for example, what emulation environment we want to exactly bring up, or shall we give a choice, or shall we give this choice to the artist, or shall we, um, th these are, these are uh, questions that are then coming up from, from this variability thing. But it's also, yeah, I think if, if, we, would, if we would artificially fix these artifacts, this would be, this would, I mean, this would change kind of the authenticity. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious for, for your take on sort of different roles and, and sort of responsibilities for different sorts of organizations in the mm -hmm. space of this sort of work. In particular, uh, the GeoCity stuff is, in, is possible because Archive Team collected that and it sort of also has um, you know, obviously there's sort of collections like that that exist in the Internet Archive and different organizations do web archiving for different purposes. And then, you know, there's sort of, are you in the position that you imagine sort of scholars or historians being in with these materials, sort of creating interpretations of them? Or are you, um, you know, so where do those lines in your mind um, come together and, and sort of what parts of this do you see breaking up for different sorts of folks in this space? I think what is maybe the uh, uh, something that I really think has to be 
rethought is this role of maybe archiving and uh, curating exhibitions or things like this because uh, if we this all these uh, artworks or in general digital artifacts they need so much context to be in general understandable it is not that I decide I will hang a picture on this wall and a picture on this wall and then they make some nice combination in the white cube but it's um, uh, yeah, as I said, we have an audience on this Tumblr thing that has never, ever seen something like this, or rather, or, or even used. And this is so, uh, it happens so fast. If you sit some, uh, if you if you would sit some young person today in front of Windows 3.11, nobody would be even <coughs> able to understand what's up. It's, uh, I mean, though they would understand well, where, why where, why are there windows in Windows? Is there something broken here? <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so I think that the that an archive of digital culture needs to provide uh, this uh, needs to provide much more context, and of course then decisions have to be made. But then I would say, as an archivist, uh, I would say, yeah, I I totally see myself in the role to make these decisions, and uh, everybody else should do the same because these are just different ac uh, accountants of, a, of encountering the same kind of thing. And each of them is right, each of them is true. So uh, that, that's it. And I, I think, yeah, of course, scholars and I love them, they're great. <laughs> but what, the, what is the problem is I think that scholars really have a citation of such complex um, artifacts because um, I can't. I can't say I link to Geogu and from from Jody and and then you should click on this thing and then you should click on that thing and then you and this is where emulation, for example, can help. And this is what we are working on also is um, to freeze an emulator at a certain state, which is not time based or anything, but at a certain state and then to be able to link to that state of the whole system. And that is what I think what scholars would really freak out about. <laughs> yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.